So, um, so yesterday we, we spent two, two slots on um, introducing exact angularization, the overall concept, the, the different parts of what you, what, what you need to understand in order to, uh, to, to uh, implement an exact diagonalization code. And so we, we basically looked at how to generate Hilbert spaces, how to handle symmetries, spatial symmetries, and also some of the AC conservation and so on. Um, and also we spent some time um, on the linear algebra part, so um, discussing the, the so-called Lantosh algorithm and some of its advantages and, and, uh, and challenges. And now today, in the, uh, certainly the first block this morning, um, there will, I will continue to give lectures. And then depending on how far I get um, in the afternoon, there might be a little bit of lecture still and also some, some uh, tutorial questions which you might work, work on here or, or later at some, at some point if you're, if you're interested. Okay, so, so far we did, um, yesterday we stopped precisely when starting to talk about observables. So the, the idea is that we, you, we have implemented, we have an understanding of the Hilbert space, of the symmetries. We, we know how to formulate the, the Hamiltonian matrix, how the ele matrix elements are calculated. And with the linear algebra solver, we are able to calculate energies, but also uh, wave functions. And then the question is, what, what can you do with this? So um, with the wave function, you can obviously calculate, um, or are obviously interested to calculate uh, different types of correlation functions. and. Um, Anyway, so different types of correlation functions. These are just a slightly more complicated uh, ones than usually. So that, the one on the left is a is a dimer dimer correlator. So this is a four point uh, spin correlation function, where where um, the bond i and j, so it's the first pair, is contracted to a singlet and s k and l, and then it's a connected correlation function. Therefore, here you subtract the disconnected part, and then that's what what you get out once you have calculated it. So the blue is the reference bond, that's like the bond ij, which is kept fixed. And the other, um, kl, is also a nearest neighbor pair. And you sample different other bonds, which have no overlap with the reference bond. And in this particular wave function, you get that pattern. And um, pro probably not everybody, everybody among you has, has uh, thought about such correlation functions. But um, I can tell you that like, if you get the pattern like that, this indicates you that the system has a strong tendency to actually break spatial symmetries. Because um, imagine what that kind of means if you think about a, sin, a spin system. This s dot s is, is almost like a projector, say, on a singlet or a, or a triplet state. And, um, and the different colors here mean um, a different sign. So a blue is a positive sign and red is a negative sign. And the width of these lines is a, is a strength of the correlation. And this basically tells you is that if you have if you put your reference bond here, you can somehow assume this projects onto a singlet. And then you see there's a very high probability to find yet another singlet on the same column here. But if you, if you check, given a singlet here, is there a, a, um, um, an enhanced probability to actually have a singlet on that row? It turns out, no, it's negative. So they're anti-correlated. So in some way, you, you see here that this is a, a system, a wave function, which has strong correlations imprinted. And these correlations are of the type that, that the bond energy wants to become modulated. Um, and so if you sum up this contribution over the whole cluster, you get something like a, an order parameter squared for this type of spatial symmetry breaking, so like a dimerization uh, kind of, of, um, of state. And, and here, there is another um, correlator which, which me measures a particular component of a spin current. And um, so this is an, an oriented operator, which means if you, if you flip those two, then the, the sign gets changed. But if you keep track of the orientation, and you, the reference bond also has, has an orientation, you see here that is a wave function, which actually has the tendency of, of having spin currents, which circulate in alternating uh, patterns on the, on the square plaquettes of the, of the square lattice. So this is an, an instance of a, of a wave function, which, which um, seems to, to show um, ordering of, of having spontaneous spin currents uh, circulating in alternating way on these square plaquettes. And so that's, that's something you, you can measure. But as a, as a technical re remark, so in, in principle, since you have the full 
a full many many body wave function, you cal calculate all kinds of correlators which you might think about. That's a that's an advantage compared to some other methods. For example, uh, quantum Monte Carlo. There are very efficient algorithms for um, for particular models, but it's it gets harder and harder to calculate more complicated correlation functions. So that might be that the Green's function works very efficiently, but if you want to cal calculate something like a three body or a four body Green's function with the, with various kind of indices, it gets harder and harder to do that efficiently in Monte Carlo. So here we limit it in system size, but on the other hand, we, because we have the full wave function, we, we can basically um, measure any kind of, um, of correlation function. Yeah, and so something is, is um, what you also have to think about is that if you use a code which, which has um, uh, spatial symmetries, you actually also need to, to symmetrize your kind of measurement operator, your spin correlations, also in appropriate manner. Which means that if you if you calculate the nearest neighbor correlator, you you, you actually the actual operator you have to calculate is take a nearest neighbor correlator and and kind of move it with all the symmetries. Um, and that's the operator which you then have to normalize by the number of symmetry operations, so that the operator you actually measure expectation value is also a symmetric operator. Otherwise, things might go go wrong. Okay, so this is the most the simplest case of just static um, equal time correlation function, just normal expectation values. <clears throat> but something which is a bit more interesting because it also links to, to some of the discussions we had um, about the, the Lanzosch algorithm is, um, is when you're interested in, in frequency um, dynamics. So that, um, that can basically be phrased into this um, generalized um, um, type of a Green's function. So this G of A, where A is a, a certain type of an operator with some uh, frequency dependence um, omega um, and some broadening um, eta. So the, the general framework is that you, you have your ground state wave function psi, which you have calculated, and then you're interested in dynamical response on, on top of that ground state. Um, and the ground state, uh, the excitations you're probing with, with, um, with this operator A. And, um, and so A depends now on the physics of your system. If, I mean, if you have a spin system or a, or a fermionic mo model or something, then and it also depends on what type of operator you're interested. That has to do with, with what you're going to probe your system. So A can be something like a spin component at the particular wave vector. It can be a, a fermionic annihilation or creation operator. In, and then uh, in, in this case, this is related to, say, photo emission experiments. Um, and here some spin components. This is related then to... Um, to um, inelastic neutron scattering. So you, you, you can choose what you want here as a, as a scattering operator, but the general form of this response function is then you, you have the ground state, you apply this operator, um, and then you have this kind of resolvent. So these are all numbers. E0 is the ground state energy. Omega is your excitation energy. This is the, the broadening factor, which you can choose at, at will. Um, and um, E or H is the Hamiltonian operator. And so it's... Um, it's, it has a structure of a, of a resolvent. And now if you give, that, if you, give you that um, expression, how would you proceed with, if, if you had no further knowledge about how one actually does it, then, um, okay, you, you might think, okay, I, I need to calculate, okay, this, this state, that's something which is easy to do. You, you apply this operator H on Psi. Okay, you, I think you know how to do that. But then how do you deal with this, with this expression here? Do you really have to go ahead and, and calculate... Um, kind of the complete spectrum of your Hamiltonian and then invert the eigenvalues. Is that what, what you're going to do? And, and actually, it turns out that's not. <coughs> there are more clever uh, ways to do that. Um, and, and it now links to these um, ideas of the Krilov space we have discussed yesterday. And now there is also, uh, it becomes clearer why in this Krilov um, algorithm you have a, a particular starting state, which we discussed yesterday. So in a, I, I recall to, to you that the, we have to, had this Krilov space, uh, k, k, with some index n, and, um, and it had the Hamiltonian or an operator, here we call it um, h, and then you have a, had a starting state phi, phi naught. <coughs> and this is what's basically, as I said, this was the span of, of all um, of phi naught, and then h phi naught, until um, h to the n phi naught. Um, and you remember yesterday in the discussion um, of the simple plane Lanzos eigensolver, we um, 
we saw that there is a Krillov space, and the Lanchos algorithm is generating us um, um, a three diagonal basis in which the Hamiltonian up to that number of iterations is, is three diagonal. But actually, these considerations yesterday, the starting state phi naught played no particular role. It, it was a random state of your Hilbert space, and it was supposed to be um, non orthogonal to the ground state, but otherwise, the actual structure of that state did not play a role. But, but now, in this application here, um, actually, the starting state becomes important. Because imagine now, if we start, if you, if you choose phi naught um, as, um, as this operator A applied to our ground state of, um, psi. So psi is this ground state, and phi naught is, um, is then A applied on to A. So this is a very particular state. This is, has to do with this scattering um, um, experiment. And, and usually, A applied on to uh, psi is, is not an eigenstate. Typically, I mean, generically, this is not an eigenstate. Um, and now, what you can see is that um, um, that's very nice. And if we now um, um, basically uh, uh, three diagonalize the Hamiltonian H by a Lanzos process, um, this really means just uh, um, three diagonalizing the Hamiltonian. So we start the Lanzos process with this particular starting vector, not with a random one, but, but with this one. And then um, the Lanzos process, as discussed yesterday, will generate us um, 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 uh, a three diagonal matrix. So here there are half diagonals. Uh, beta n, and here, here it is zero. Um, and something which is also remarkable, I mean, this you, that's from yesterday, basically, but the, the, the specific uh, point is now, is that our starting state, um, in that basis in which the Hamiltonian is made three diagonal, the starting state is just a vector with component one, and the rest is zero. So in, if you're in the Krilov, in the Lanchos basis of your Krilov space, then the, this, this particular starting state is really just the first component of your of your Krilov space. Um, and now if you go back and, and um, look at this expression, what you really want to know is not, you don't want to know the entire inverted H, shifted and inverted H, but you actually only want to know basically the, the, one, the one element of this operator in that, in that basis, namely the, the element basically 1, 1. You see, um, you, you want to invert that operator, but in the end you're sandwiching that with, um, with, with here and there the, the conjugate of each other. But this amounts to just calculating the matrix element 1, 1 of this expression. So, so this, is, this is an expression of H, um, but in, um, basically in the, in the Krilov space. So say it is index K. And, um, and what you actually want to know is, um, is basically um, so um, so what, what I mean here is that the starting state in our in this basis in which um, H is three diagonal, um, the starting state is just the, uh, the, the vector with only component one set one and the rest is zero, and um, and, and this is the, the bra of it, and this is the expression. So these these uh, numbers like e naught plus omega plus i eta I call z. It's just a complex number, um, and so I have. I, the, the, the operator here is C minus H um, constrained to the Krilov space to the minus one. And this basically just means that this expression is basically just the element um, C minus H to the minus one. And then it's just the, the element one, one. Do you, do you follow so far? So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a particular choice. So what we're doing is that we're taking this, the state um, um, a very particular starting state. We're building the Krilov space on top of that particular vector. Um, we get the three diagonal matrix because we can start the land source process with any state. So we do it for this one. Uh, and this, in this uh, Krilov space, which is generated on top of that starting state, the matrix is three diagonal. Um, 
And now we have not yet employed to the fact that H is three diagonal, but we know that in our Krilov basis, the particular uh, Green's function you want to calculate amounts to having um, just calculating the inverse of, uh, uh, of the inverse of C minus H. But then we are only interested in one particular matrix element of that big matrix. And so the point is we don't actually have to calculate the entire inverted um, C minus H, but we just want to know one matrix element, namely the, the top left corner, if you wish. And now, um, so that's one step. And then the next step is that to, to now recognize that, that C minus H um, is still three, three diagonal because it basically just amounts to, um, yeah, I mean, to, to put everything a minus, to, to, to negate um, H. And then we, well, we're every, on the diagonal, we just put the C, C minus alpha everywhere. So that's then C minus H. And now uh, the goal is just to calculate the, the, the one, one element of the inverse of, um, of that matrix. Um, of, um, of C minus H. Um, and then I, I am not explicitly doing it, but the key point is now, since the, the, this matrix is three diagonal, you can now use um, um, this Laplace kind of um, de development theorem for the inverse, where you can actually, um, where the, ma the matrix element, the entry of, a, of an individual matrix of the inverse can be calculated by, um, by calculating the, the determinant of the, the remnant of the matrix if you delete one, the first entry. So if you do that and you think about this particular structure, then you actually re realize that what you, you have to do is calculate uh, a continued fraction which implies these um, these elements. So I'm, I'm not I'm not um, um, working that out completely. I can it's, it's documented in in the literature. But the key point is that since you have a three diagonal matrix, calculating the very first element of the inverse is something which you can systematically develop, and then you arrive at an expression with continued fraction which involves um, um, the alphas and betas and c in some particular way, and then the continued fraction terminates um, basically af after that finite uh, dimension of, uh, of the Krilov space, and then you get um, an, an, uh, an expression for this, for this um, Green's function at that particular um, um, size of the Krilov space. And so you, you see now that, that um, the, the fact that you have these Krilov algorithms available is a very powerful tool, because as I said, if you go ahead uh, naively, you would think Okay, I'm, I'm having a representation of A times psi, but I really have to invert H, and for that I basically have to know all the uh, excited energies exactly, and then, um, because you can also write down something like a Lehmann representation, where the spectral function is then basically the, the same as having the overlaps between your A times psi with all the excited states. So that, that then becomes obviously very expensive. You really go ahead and calculate all the excited states exactly, and you cal calculate overlap. That's very expensive. Here you see that's actually not, not required. But using this, this um, um, nice Krilov approach and exploiting this, this algorithm, you actually get um, um, you get a rather cheap expression for this, um, for this spectral function, and that really um, is the key why we can then calculate a spectral function um, here, that's, a, that's an example of, of a particular Heisenberg model on a triangular lattice in, in zero magnetic field. And this is basically um, some spin structure factor. So my A is basically something like a, a C component at different momenta. And so these are different um, momenta, these different um, individual plots. And here you can now see that the kind of spectral function which, which you um, obtain. And so the, the the point is basically that in your, in your uh, continued fraction, um, I mean, you have your alphas and your betas, you have calculated them once and for all. They are there, they come from this Lanthorst process, but once they are there, you can then um, reevaluate the continued fraction for different values of C, and then you, and by changing Z, you can basically change either the broadening eta, or you can change the frequency which you want to sample. So in principle, you just may take a grid of frequency as fine as you want, and you reevaluate the continued fraction for all the frequencies. But this, since the, the alphas and the betas do not change, you only have to do your Krilov run once, and then evaluating it for all the frequencies is, is very cheap. So, um, yes? Is it obvious that uh, the, the matrix element of Z minus H uh, uh, is 1, 1? No, is it obvious that, is it obvious that it's the same if you do it in the quite of space or, or if you 
either h that is minus h to the power of space or in the yeah, there's, some, there's something which, which I have not yet mentioned I would have come to is that what's the, what's the size of the Krylov space? That's like a free parameter. Um, and kind of the, the, it actually depends on the, on the structure of your spectral functions, how big that Krylov space has to be um, in order to actually get the correct shape of the spectral function. And, and the point is basically, if you have a spectral function, which is, um, I mean, in a finite system, a spectral function is just a collection of delta functions because the, the spectrum is discrete. You can just have a bunch of delta functions. But a bunch can mean one or two important. It could mean a hundred. It could mean a thousand. And, um, and so that depends on the structure of the spectral function, how it actually looks like. And so the, the controlling parameter is basically you have to increase your, your Krylov space um, uh, to make it large enough to actually correctly reproduce the spectral function. So, so that is something which you have to check by basically looking at different um, sizes of your Krylov space, which you do here, and then you check whether your spectral function basically converges um, with the resolution you have chosen. So if you choose a resolution eta, so that's the broadening, that's like choosing a resolution. You can choose, choose it freely, but once you set it, you can then look at different sizes of the Krylov space and basically check whether your spectral function at the re resolution you're looking at is, is converging or not. <clears throat> okay, so that's um, that's something, and um, and actually something which is also interesting, and which will have to do with the real time evolution. I'm just going to discuss on the next slide. Um, something which is also interesting is that these techniques can actually also be used to calculate basically the the overlap of an initial state with um, with a Hamiltonian. Because if you're interested in time evolution, then um, you might want to know if your initial state, which is, potent, which is not an eigenstate, typically, if you're doing some quench experiments, you would like to know whether in, how an initial state decomposes on the, on the eigenspectrum of the Hamiltonian by which you're integrating your system in time. Um, so, I mean, you, see, you have some... You have some psi naught, some initial function, and then you evolve it with a, with a, with a Hamiltonian and... and um, and basically, you would like to know what the overlap is of, of psi naught with, um, say, with, with the phi ends, where, where, um, where, where, where basically the phi ends are eigen, eigenstates of, um, of the Hamiltonian by which you're, you're propagating. <coughs> and, and again, I mean, you would like to, to know this. Um, and the question is, what, how would you do that? Again, I think the simplest way is just to calculate the spectrum of H, calculate its eigenfunctions, and then you go, you, you, you loop over all eigenfunctions, you calculate the overlap, basically, as it's written here. But there's, again, a, a way how you can do that by actually um, taking phi naught as a starting state for a Krylov run. So you take, take phi naught, you do a Krylov run with, the, with your new Hamiltonian on top of, of that one, and then uh, by doing basically, having basically no scattering, just uh, taking phi naught this initial state, you get H. And then if you calculate kind of the, the resulting uh, spectral function, the resolvent on it, you basically get the spectral distribution, which means you get the curve, which, which has peaks at the energies um, and with the weight, which corresponds to the overlap of that. So you get an energy resolved decomposition of your initial state in the basis of your, of your Hamiltonian by which you're propagating. And so you can basically see how broad um, your initial function is, is, is um, distributed over the eigenlevels of the, of the Hamiltonian by which you're, you're propagating. And that's actually also quite useful because, um, again, I mean, these Krylov type methods, they are um, comparatively expensive as like, um, spar like uh, lunch runs for ground states, even though you're talking about excited states. And so that's, that's quite nice because you, you can use these sparse matrix techniques and with a few hundred or perhaps a, a thousand iterations or so, you, you get already a very good idea how your, your starting state is decomposed in the eigenbasis and then you, you, get, uh, you can develop a physical picture out of that. And it's clear that for Hilbert spaces of millions, it's impossible to calculate all eigenstates and calculate the exact um, overlap uh, state by state. That's not possible, but with this um, uh, Krylov technique, to kind of do the Krylov run with, with this um, non-eigenstate, you, you're actually able to learn something about these overlap distributions, even for Hilbert spaces, which are larger than what you can deal with with exact full uh, diagonalization. Do you have questions so far?
And so another um, closely linked, yes? Yes. Yeah. You know, if you have uh, constructed the, the Krylov space, you have these um, alphas and betas, um, and then um, then you have to to write down a continued um, a a fraction. And this has to do with the fact that you're developing. There are linear algebra formulas like how how to develop um, the, um, an element of the inverse of your matrix by doing consecutive. Um, 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 determinant calculations where you delete rows and columns so out of your matrix, and if you're applying these ideas to this particular form of, of, with a, of a three-diagonal matrix, um, if you do that, then you realize that you're actually um, getting a continued fraction, so like a fraction, like one divided by and then one plus, and then the, the, these um, alphas and betas start to enter, and so, so you get the continued fraction, and it stops once you have you, um, at the level um, n co corresponding to the size of the Krylov space. So, so there you're using the explicit form that your matrix is three-diagonal and not a general one. And then you can actually kind of by formally on paper, you can develop um, that the form of that matrix element, of that one particular matrix element of the inverse, by doing um, um, a kind of a, a recursive evaluation of, of determinants. And then you realize that that um, kind of um, turns out to be a continued fraction involving these, these elements of the three, on the three, three diagonals of your matrix. And so, and so um, a continued fraction in the end gives you a number because it's, just a, it's just a continued fraction which involves these numbers alpha, beta, and c. And if you evaluate it, you get a number. And that's, that's then basically the, the value of your Green's function at the value of c which you have chosen. And, you can, and then you choose another value of c, maybe choosing another frequency. You reevaluate the continued fraction, gives you another number. And if you do that for many frequencies, you get this continuous curve like it is plotted here. Because, because formally what you're doing is that it, it's the same. Like if you take um, A times Psi as a starting state or some other state, Psi not like, a, like an initial state, it, it amounts to the same. This, this is like giving you something like the spectral, the spectral decomposition of this state in the, in the, in the in here it's the excited state space basically, but you can also take a, a wave function which does not come from scattering, but which is the ground state of another Hamiltonian. And so doing these type of spectral functions for time evolution amounts to the same thing basically. Yeah, so another application which is I, I find quite uh, important is, um, and also where these Krilov algorithms come in very handy, is, um, is real-time um, evolution. So it's it's again the same story. If you um, if you're interested in actually um, knowing um, the propagator, so the propagator is the the matrix exponential of minus i t times h, where h is your your Hamiltonian. So if, if you want to go at any instant to any time, the obvious approach is to to uh, take your Hamiltonian and completely diagonalize it. Then you can exponentiate your propagator in the eigenbasis, which is just the exponential of all the, the, the energies times times t. And then you go back into your basis, and then you have the propagator for all times. But this requires to really be able to calculate the entire spectrum for a Hamiltonian. And as we have discussed, then you're basically limited to, say, about 100,000, where you can calculate matrix dimensions of 100,000. There you're able to calculate the complete spectrum. But if you're working with a, with a Hilbert space of millions or billions, this is clearly not possible. And then you might ask, I mean, is it still possible to do real-time evolution? And the answer is yes. So if you give up the fact that you want to know the complete propagator, where basically you can put in any time and you can put in any starting state, whatever, but if you're willing to give up that and don't just focus on the on on a on a uh, initial state you choose, and then doing a time evolution for some time interval, uh, then there are actually these Krilov methods available where you can propagate um, a, um, a wave function you chose as an initial state in time by co consecutive time um, um, interval boosts, basically. And that also re relies on Krilov techniques. You, you see that these Krilov ideas are, are really quite, quite powerful. <coughs> and so, the, so here this is, this is uh, just an application, but I can give you another um, 
uh, sh short um, idea. So here now th the idea uh, in that particular state uh, um, is still that we, we, we build a Krilov space, but phi naught is then really kind of our uh, psi naught, that, that, that's the initial state the initial state which you want to, to propagate. Um, so uh, psi naught, that's our initial state, and that's then kind of phi naught, because phi naught was my convention to, to label the Lanthosch vectors. So we, we choose a particular initial state, that's the initial state of our quench dynamics. We build a Krilov space of a certain size, um, and then, okay, we, we now remove the signs and the z's again, so this is just the, the, the standard Lanthosch um, form of the Hamiltonian in the Krilov space. So that's the Hamiltonian. And now the idea is again uh, quite simple. Um, our, our initial state in the Krilov basis has, has this uh, uh, form. So um, uh, phi naught basically has a component representation of a vector like that. Um, and, um, and so the natural thing to do then is now to, to calculate um, um, a Krilov space of a certain size. Um, and this is a, a rather small matrix, typically. Um, and now the, the idea is you, you can just exponentiate that small matrix. So, um, so calculate basically the matrix exponential, exponential my i in t h, but h constrained to the Krilov space. So this, this small matrix, so we, we call that like u of u of t. Again, a constraint to the Krilov space, so that's a that's a small matrix. So if your Krilov space is is 20 vectors, which you have which you have chosen, then then this matrix here, which lives in the Krilov space, is, is a 20 by 20 matrix. And calculating this this matrix exponential is straightforward for a 20 by 20 matrix. That's no effort. So so you can do that. And now th since um, and now you can see since the starting state, I mean, what you want to do in the Krilov space is then to, to apply um, this propagator U of T uh, constraint to the Krilov space. You apply it onto, onto that, our starting state. But since our starting state in the Krilov um, uh, base is, is, um, is trivial, it's just the first component, you're basically applying that to, to the vector 1, 1 with the rest all the zeros, and then you basically see you're, you're just getting the first column of your propagator is the linear combination of your Krilov vectors in the full Hilbert space that gives you the time propagated um, uh, state. So this basically means that, um, or, you're, or you're getting the first, um, just the first column basically of, um, of this U, so it's U, um, U1, um, one, and then U1, two, and so on. <coughs> and now you, you can again ask, um, what is the relation of the size of your, of your Krilov space uh, to, the, to the time um, interval, which is, um, which is something you, you might, might be wondering. And actually it turns out that mathematicians have really proved the, uh, the, um, the convergence of these algorithms. So it, it actually turns out that, um, that if, you, if you fix a certain time interval, so you take a starting state and you say you take a given time interval by which you want to propagate your wave function, then you can actually prove that the convergence of the quality of your propagated wave function is exponentially in the size of the Krilov space, which basically means for, for each time interval, uh, there, you can basically converge the, the time integration by making the Krilov space uh, sufficiently large. And now you might wonder, um, what does sufficiently large mean? Um, and that actually turns out, like, if you're doing some, this is a, this is a many body quench of some bose hubbard model, where we're comparing also to time-dependent DMRG. But, um, but the point here, here is you, you basically want to sample a dynamics. And so here the time steps are, are rather short, something like a, a few parts of, um, perhaps um, um, a few parts in 10 to the minus 2 or so. Um, and then, so these are rather short time intervals. And then it actually turns out that the Krilov space you need to generate to be extremely precise for this uh, time interval propagation just amounts to a, a handful of Krilov vector, perhaps five or 10 or so. And then you're already converged. And then, however, if you make the interval larger, if you directly want to, to jump from, from basically from zero to one, then it can actually require a, a lot of uh, iteration, something like 50 or 100 or something. But even that, that is, is in principle feasible. You just have to make your Krilov space large enough. 
Um, and actually, there's also a, a kind of a truncation criterion, um, which I think is, can also be made quite intuitive. So the idea is basically, um, you see here the time propagated uh, vector in the Krilov space of your, of your starting state has this representation. And what you can basically check is whether the last, uh, the last um, uh, component here of your time propagated vector in the Krilov space, if these components here start to become smaller and smaller, this basically tells you that, that if you're expanding your Krilov space, you're not adding something substantial anymore. Because if basically your, your time propagated wave function in the Krilov space um, does not profit from the Krilov space getting larger, the result is basically converged for that time interval which you have set. And so there's a, an, an, a tie, an, um, an intuitive criterion somehow to check for, um, for what this last time propagated um, element of that vector is actually doing as you make your Krilov space larger. Because Krilo, making Krilov space larger means this, ve this vector gets longer and longer. And if these components down there start to become smaller and smaller, it basically tells you that even if you make the, your Krilov space larger, it does not make your calculation more precise because you're converged for that time interval. And if you make your time interval larger, basically means you will probably will have to, to blow up your, your Krilov space. But that's some, it just tells you the, the message is that you, you can formulate a, um, a convergence criterion, like having a, a, a very accurate representation of a propagated wave function. And then, then you run your, your Krilov algorithm. I mean, you do um, matrix vector multiplication. And after each ma matrix vector multiplication, you basically check. Because this is inexpensive, you can basically check what is the last component in that vector. And if you see that this last component of the vector is basically converging to zero, then you actually can stop if it's below your co convergence criterion. And then you're actually uh, guaranteed to have made a very accurate time, time integration. Yes? 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 Exactly, yeah. Uh, is there a way to, to prove that there is no accumulation of errors, uh, cancellation of errors, one propagates for a very long time? Yeah, I mean, we made, we made some checks because at least for small sizes, you, um, as explained, you can actually calculate the full propagator and then you can check or you can also um, <coughs> tighten the, error, the convergence criteria in this Lanthos propagation and check whether your results um, actually change. And so at least numerically we check that uh, and I think also that, I guess that is mathematically. This is what is the convenient time step to use the criteria that you have just described. Because in principle, I guess you can do a few very long uh, steps, but you need the last step. Yeah, I mean, often it's actually dictated by the sampling frequencies by which you want to sample your physics. It depends on what you want, but but it's true. I mean, uh, if you re if really you you somehow want to make a long boost in time, I would be a bit careful. So one one should probably check if you're doing like a, a time step of ten or something where your initial where your kind of frequency natural frequency in the Hubbard model is actually like like you, which is very large. Perhaps you should really check whether everything's working fine. But but here here you somehow want to resolve some oscillation phenomena. So somehow we have to sample so just measure sufficiently frequently in order to resolve the dynamics. Just kind of by Nyquist theory, we need to sample large enough. So, but if you're not interested in actually resolving that, you can also take time steps which are larger. So, so what, it, what is really nice is that say if you think about other time integration methods like Trotter methods, which you might have heard of. Or some Runge Kutta, you, uh, you can also formulate Runge Kutta in some uh, for in your Hilbert space to do time evolution. But these algorithms have clearly have a, an error which has to do with the size of your time step. And these methods do not have that because um, you give a time step, and then the algorithm basically makes sure by increasing the Krilov space to its uh, sufficient size that basically you made no uh, detectable error on on that time step. But of course the um, the larger your time step is, the more effort you have to work. But there is no there is no time discretization error if your um, kind of error criterion is tight enough. There is basically no no time discretization error. That's also nice because then you don't have to make runs for different kind of time steps and so on because you to take a time step and then if you're if you're um, following this error criterion, then you you're guaranteed basically to have accurate results and there's no trotter error or something like that. <coughs> yes. Does this method uh, depend on how highly excited my initial state is? So, yeah, it has, a, it has an, an impact. Um, because something which I actually is not so well known, but I, I can tell you, is that um, uh, both basically, 
I mean, basically what you're doing, um, if you're calculating this Krilov space, um, um, the, the, the Lanzos values here, this alpha and this beta, these coefficients of the T matrix, they actually have a physical interpretation that, that's perhaps not known to, to a lot of people. Although, now if one says it, it's actually obvious. Look, like, I mean, alpha zero, if you think what that means in the algorithm, it's basically the expectation value of your operator H in your starting state. So alpha zero is actually the mean energy of your starting state, of, or of whatever, of that state. If you do um, um, Green's function, it's basically expectation value of your excited state is A times pi, which you have generated. And if you do quench dynamics, it's basically the mean energy of your, of your starting state. But then you can work ahead and actually figure out that beta is actually related to the variance of your, of your initial state. So you can figure out basically how broad your energy is fluctuating in, uh, kind of in terms of a, as, a, as a second moment of your, of your state. And that's also an, an, an something which is nice. Um, if, you, if you actually start to make a run with an eigenstate of your Hamiltonian, you can also ask what's happening if, you, if, you're, if your excited state or the initial state is an eigenstate. It basically means that you, you start with, with alpha, you get the mean energy because the energy is finite. But then actually beta 1 will be 0 because it has no variance. It's an eigenstate. And then your Krilov space is actually exactly uh, closed because it's an invariant subspace in principle. Um, and generically, you do not expect it to close it before reaching kind of the, the Hilbert space size. But if you have an eigenstate or if you have an invariant subspace, the Krilov algorithm will, will actually stop exactly after the size of your invariant subspace. And an eigenstate is obviously an invariant subspace under your operator, so then you're done. So the algorithm actually tells you if you have, by, by chance, um, started with an eigenstate, the Krilov algorithm will actually stop. And then what it will do is, I mean, if there's nothing wrong with it, it will stop. Then it will just generate the phase because you have a one-dimensional state. And then you're just rotating your state with the phase, which is exactly what you should, you should do. So it's also interesting that. Um, but then you, you can go on um, regarding your question. So if you have a highly excited state, um, um, which is not an eigenstate, basically you can transform these, these coefficients, these alphas and betas, into higher and higher moments. So you're actually making a moment expansion of your, free, of your energy distribution of your initial state, and that has an impact on, on how you're, you're propagating. So the question is not that much how highly excited your state is, but how broad it is in energy. The broader it is in energy, the more structure it has, then, te um, then probably you need to have more uh, for a given time interval, if your state is broader, you probably need more Lanzos iterations. And if a state which is very only few frequencies kind of contribute, then you probably can can keep your Krilov space smaller. But the nice thing is you don't have to worry about that. If you use this convergence criterion, which I have discussed here, then it basically um, the algorithm um, kind of finds out by itself that it has to do a lot of iterations before converging for that given time step, or whether it will actually um, um, stop earlier. So it. But that's actually something I, I really like is that if you do all these things properly, uh, this, uh, this Krilov time step, uh, this Krilov time evolution is really a kind of a workhorse which, which you can implement without worrying too much. I mean, you, I mean, you have to implement this, this convergence criterion, obviously, um, but I, li I like that, that this is the only knob you have to, to put, and then it actually works really quite, quite reliably. Um, and there are other methods which I, I don't want to describe, but which go under the name of Chebyshev methods. I think they are also very, very efficient and very, very powerful. But, um, but there, for example, you need to, have to make some mapping of your initial Hamiltonian, which has, a, which has a certain bandwidth, onto some interval, basically, of energies between minus 1 and 1. And so basically, you always need a first estimator of like what is the bandwidth of your Hamiltonian. And this can all be done. It's not impossible. But it's just you, you first have to figure out what your bandwidth is. You have to map it onto an interval. And if your mapping is not exact, it might induce some additional overhead, which, which you don't perhaps don't, don't want to um, do, do. So in that sense, I, I find this Krilov time evolution method really quite flexible and, and really a workhorse tool to do all kinds of like spectral decompositions, real-time evolution, and also the spectral function. So it's really, I think this is a very powerful, a very powerful uh, concept. Yes? Yes? No, no, you, you, n can be 100 or so. Because you need two less diplomas. 
Yeah. Yeah, but, but full solver, I mean, these full solvers for matrices up to, in principle, up to 100,000 can be done. Obviously, you don't want Krillov spaces of 100,000, but Krillov spaces of 100 or a few hundred, it, I mean, numerically, it's immediate to calculate the spectrum of a 100 times 100 matrix. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. no, no, but, no, this is really close. Here there's nothing exponential of your physical Hilbert space. This is just um, the size of the Krilov space, which is... <coughs> yeah, and just as, as an, a real-time um, example, so here I'm showing um, just some, some spreading dynamics, which we have calculated using the Krilov method. So what we're doing here, this is a, a Heisenberg Hamiltonian, uh, but we're actually working in a, in a sector where basically we're having all spins up, apart from one spin in the center, which we have flipped down. And so this is not an eigenstate, um, but it's actually a superposition of all these spin flips of a ferromagnet with one flipped spin. Uh, its initial, initial state is localized, and then we let it evolve, and that's basically what you get. So I don't want to discuss the physics, it's rather simple, but it's just an example where where um, in, you can also do that uh, in principle on um, uh, using full diagonalization, but you can also scale that up, and there's no, you see, because this uh, basically 200 times 200 gives you something like 40,000, I think. Um, that, that's something which, which is still feasible with full diagonalization, but actually if you do that using this Krilov method, it's extremely cheap, because doing a f um, kind of for each time step, you do a few um, um, sparse matrix vector matrix vector multiplications of dimensions 40,000. That's rather quick. Um, you do that, and then you can propagate in, in time, no problem. Whereas if you want to do that kind of 40,000 with the full diagonalization, you can do that, but it's about on, more or less on the limit what you can do. But, but, here, but here you can also do like a, a thousand times a thousand lattice, because then your Hilbert space is a million. It's only a single particle problem, but doing Krilov with a million is no problem. Whereas, I mean, it's, it's impossible to do um, a thousand times a thousand um, problem that way. I mean, one has to say this is an exactly soluble problem, so you actually don't want to do numerics on it because it has a closed form solution. It's just the product of two Bessel functions, but it, it's just a simple example. Um, but you can also do a, a two particle problem, and that actually turns out to have somewhat more structure. <clears throat> So what, what's happening here now, here it's the same Hamiltonian, it's a Heisenberg Hamiltonian, and the initial state is two flipped spins which are on the nearest neighbor bond, which is oriented in the x direction. So the initial state is just two particles nearest neighbor, so two flipped spins in the middle, um, and, that, um, and then the left plot is just the SC profile, so basically where are these two particles moving in time, and then you, you can see it has a particular form. And these two are two other observables where it's basically projecting the wave function onto two neighboring spins um, at, at later time. And then what you, what you can, can learn from that plot is that the, um, kind of this initial, this single particle <coughs> is just ballistically spreading and you have some oscillations because these are Bessel functions, but there's no additional structure. That, that particle just spreads ballistically. But now you can ask what happens if you have these two, two particles and then you see there's something like a, a, ballistic, a ballistic spreading of two particles as well. So at, if you just look at the density, it looks rather similar. But what you can see here, if you look at the X projector, is that there's actually something like a bound state of two particles, which is actually um, propagating in that direction um, somewhat easily. Um, but it's actually not spreading in that direction so much. You can see, I mean, you see that the bound state, because it have, in the projector you really need to have two particles close by, otherwise you, you, you don't get anything, but it's actually intense mostly on that line, so it's actually not spreading that much in the, in the vertical direction, but it, this bound state is mostly propagating in a counter, propagating way along, along this, um, the horizontal axis. So it seems there is something like a bound state, um, so that your, your initial dynamics has have a part which is ballistically flying out. These are like single particle excitations, which are not that much correlated. And then there is a bound state of two particles, which is also a fraction of your wave function, which actually seems to fly out, but, but um, directional in one, in one direction. And this is a, also a nice application of, um, of, um, of this Krilov, uh, Krilov method. 
And here you can see this is a 60 by 60 lattice with two particles. So here the Hilbert space is already um, significantly larger. Uh, but still, you can do that with Krilov, whereas if you want to do that with full diagonalization, you might reach your limits at some, at some point. And you can go significantly larger with, um, with this Krilov method. OK, are there questions on this um, integration? Yeah. If not, I would like to, to tell you a little bit now about uh, parallelization uh, strategies, which some of them are, are simple to implement. Um, so you might want to hear about that. And then I'll sh also show you a bit what you have to, to think about if you're doing um, large scale uh, parallelization using uh, distributed memory techniques. So, so here I, um, I show you schematically how a matrix vector multiplication looks like. So as, as we know in the Lanchos algorithm, you just, um, the Lanchos algorithm just requests us a given some input uh, vector u to apply h onto it and to, to deliver back v, which is the product of the two. And now the, the question is basically how do you actually parallelize that? Now, um, we have a lot of, of uh, shared memory machines, so multi-core machines where the memory is shared, where memory access is not a problem. You don't have to, to uh, do particular programming for that. Um, however, we have multiple cores at our disposal. And the question is now a bit, how, how actually do you um, uh, parallelize such a loop? So it's, it's a rather simple consideration, but there's one way to make it wrong, and therefore I, I want to put it out. So one thing is basically you could, you could say I basically... Um, reserve one part of my starting vector here to be one core, this is another core, and so on. And then you can ask, um, basically, should I um, basically apply then only a part of H, that one, on, or, or, or that part here onto that? But then it actually turns out, um, if you do that, if you basically um, distribute over the U vector for the, the different parts to different cores, it actually turns out that if you're calculating results, you will actually interfere on the result side because different parts of your source vector, when applied onto H, they get actually spread over all over V. And that's a problem because then two cores, two, two um, uh, threads, actually might write and update the result in the result vector at the same time. And you have to uh, forbid that because if both are writing at the same time, there's a danger that one of the two results is getting overwritten by the other. Um, and so you have to synchronize access to the result vector. Uh, but that slows down things because you, may, you have to make sure that there's exclusive access to, to updating these memory cells. So that's not what you want, especially because there's a simple other solution, which is actually distribute your, your problem over the result vector, which basically means that, that each, vec each core is responsible to calculate one part part of the result vector, and so you, you clearly discriminate that, so there's no interference on that level. Then, then um, core one um, somehow calculates the matrix elements in here. It's a sparse matrix, but still kind of all sparse matrix elements in here are calculated, and all of the cores basically will, will, uh, will read matrix uh, elements from U, but this is not a problem because read can be made concurrent. Like, uh, it's not important which thread reads the, reads the element in U first because they're not altering it. It's really always giving the same result. So it's just a simple remark, but you have to worry about that. If you're kind of parallelizing your for loops the wrong way, your results might actually be wrong. But if you parallelize over the right, the correct loop, um, you have no problems and it will be, be a, a very good uh, speed up by doing that. <clears throat> yeah, so that, that's the explanation that there are, you have no uncritical concurrent reads, which means the different cores might simultaneously read elements from you, but that's not the problem. But we make sure that each core only writes and updates results in one where he, he basically is responsible for it and there's no interference. So here are some benchmark results from, okay, in the meantime, somewhat older machines, but it still gives you a, a flavor of, what, of what's um, happening. So this is some problem where um, here we're plotting the time per three iterations of such a Lanzos iteration. So th they were kind of expensive at the time. Um, and so th these were different machines, an SGI origin, some IBM Power uh, 690, some P4, um, Power 4 processor, a Sun machine, an IBM with a Power 5, and an SGI Altix. 
And this is just interesting to illustrate that this was every, every, um, all the time it was the same code with the same parallelization strategy, but there were machines like this black one, um, where act, and also the, the gray, uh, the, the brown one here, where the speed up was actually not that good, which means that although the code is, is, is very nicely parallelized, actually the hardware is not able to keep track of, um, or is not fast enough to deliver the memory we're, we're reading and so on. And so if you're using more threads, it's actually not speeding up that much. But you can see other machines like this, this green one and also the blue and red one. Actually, there the speed up is quite nice because this dotted line, which you might see or not see, they're actually indicating like a 1 over n um, improvement. And so you can see that, that basically on, on these machines, um, using four times as, as much threads gives you basically a four time lower uh, wall clock time for this for these matrix vector um, multiplications. And no nowadays, um, as I said, um, workstations are multi-core machines, so it's actually quite simple to to update an ED code with this parallel um, OpenMP type uh, parallelization to just use m multiple cores, and then one matrix vector multiplication really gets uh, speed sped up a, a lot. And then this can basically be done whether you recalculate your matrix on the fly each time or whether you store it on, uh, in memory, you, you can apply it to both, to both uh, settings. Um, so obviously the, the problems we have described somehow assume that, um, that you can write down the whole Hilbert space and the Lanchos vectors that they all fit in the memory of your workstation or of your shared memory machine. So, so a typical sizes nowadays can be uh, say a few hundred gigabytes that perhaps what the fat workstation or a compute node on a shared memory workstation um, um, typically has. Um, and th th that puts you a, a limit on, onto that. Um, and then there's a, a simpler um, extension to that. If the problem still fits on memory, but somehow you have a, a large number of matrix elements, so that's typically when you, when you say, if you do quantum chemistry-like problems, where the Hamiltonian is like a four-body, a four-body, uh, um, um, four-fermion interaction, or also quantum hole problems, as I explained to you yesterday, they somehow have like a, a number of matrix elements which scales with the th third power of the number of orbitals. Uh, even though the Hilbert space is not huge, the number of matrix elements is substantially larger than in, in the nearest neighbor spin model, so the actual number of matrix elements to process is quite large. So in, in that case, we can actually use a, a, a hybrid, a hybrid parallelization, which basically means that um, we're now distributing our problem over different nodes, and on each node, there is um, on each node we actually keep a copy of our u vector, the one which the Lanchos algorithm gives us as an input. But on each node, um, we can on each node we now apply a part of our matrix onto that vector, which we keep completely, and we only calculate one part of the result vector. And if the node by itself is a shared memory machine with m multiple cores, we, we can obviously slice that into more cores on, a, on, a, on the same node in the same way as I described on the previous slide. But, but here, uh, between that one, there is no shared memory. So that's an, a different node with another uh, chunk of memory. And on that one, um, the node 2 just calculates one part of the result vector. And so th these calculations at that step are completely independent. And what you then do after each of these nodes is, has finished its task of calculating a part of the, of the uh, U vector, the, the result, sorry, the V vector, the result, then you do a, a broadcast uh, call with, uh, with MPI, which basically, uh, this has the task to actually send the result of one and to broadcast it to all the others. Then all other nodes know about the result of one and then two does it, it, it the same, and three and four. And so in that way, all the nodes, um, after the iteration there, they know what V is, and they have their local copy of it. Uh, and then locally, since uh, U and V are both are, are all then locally available, you can do your Lanzos step, like the linear algebra in the Lanzos algorithm, you can do on the same uh, node, and you can come up with a new U, with the next U for the next Lanzos iteration. Then again, you, uh, each node calculates its local uh, contribution, and then you broadcast it, and then you basically replicate your problem onto different, 
nodes. Each one only calculates a, a part of it, and then you're, you're broadcasting the result. And that's also quite quite efficient. But again, the limitation is that the entire Lanchos vectors actually fit onto your memory. So this is more for applications where you have a lot of matrix elements, but not yet really huge Hilbert spaces. <coughs> and so this is a, a scaling example of um, um, so-called strong scaling example. So strong scaling means that we, we, we always take the same physical problem we want to solve, but we increase the number of processors. That's, um, that's a strong scaling. Whereas weak scaling would be that you, you actually increase the physical problem size while increasing the, the number of processors. So that's not what we're doing here. Um, so this is a particular problem of some um, Fermi fermion problem formulated in momentum space. Therefore, it has a large number of matrix elements. Um, and, um, and here you can see on that axis it's the number of, of CPUs, um, whereas here there's the, number, the time, um, the wall clock time uh, per iteration. And then you can see uh, for very sh in a very small number of process accounts you have a significant time spent in one iteration. And as you, as you um, increase the number of CPUs, the, lo the time for the local multiplication is really going down as 1 over n, basically. Uh, that's very good. The broadcast time also goes down initially, but then it, it levels off and it stays more or less constant or, or increases slightly, going from 500 to a, or 512 to 1024. So that's here that starts to saturate. Um, but since the broadcast time is actually a small, uh, small time compared to the local multiplication, you actually get a very nice speed up from very small process accounts up to roughly 512. You get a, a speed up of about 500. And it's only if you double again. Um, then the broadcast time which saturates comes in, and therefore your, your speed up is, is uh, degrading a bit. But still, in the range between basically a few cores up to 500, you have almost perfect uh, parallel scaling. So it shows that for this type of problem, um, that's actually really an, a nice thing to do because there's no, there's no really expensive communication apart from that broadcast call, and so that's actually quite fine. Yes? So you have mentioned the standardization momentum space. No, I mean, this particular problem is something like you, you take a Hubbard model, you, you formulate it in momentum space, but that's not necessarily a good thing. But what you can start to do is then truncate the, truncate the, the momenta which you take in the reciprocal space. Uh, for Yeah, the application there was actually something where, where we actually develop, uh, look only at the strong coupling physics at the so-called saddle points. Like if you think about the Hubbard model, there are, there are saddle points in the dispersion where the density of states has, has Van Hove peaks. So we're basically putting a lot of k-space points around there, whereas we, we delete some of the others. So, so it's really not a real space Hubbard model anymore written in momentum space, but it's, it's motivated from a real space Hubbard model. But then we start truncating a part of the, of, the, uh, of the momentum orbitals and put more orbitals around other points. So it's really like more like uh, discretizing a field theory if you want, because you, you do something directly in momentum space. <coughs> okay, and, but but now if you if you want to to deal with problems which are um, very large, I mean there there are two. Two, implicate, um, two kind of uh, challenges. On the one hand, there are really problems which, which do not fit on current shared memory machines. And, and one, another thing is also that, that probably Thomas Schultz has told you about that in the last lecture as well, is that somehow sh shared memory machines do not, I mean, uh, we, have, we have these workstations we all know about, or these compute clusters in, in Linux clusters, and they get larger and larger, but still, like, um, um, if you have like one terabyte per, per such a node, it's already a huge quantity. And it's not so common to really have a, a, a very large shared memory machines. I think I have never heard about a shared memory machine, I think, which has more than 16 terabytes. But for some machine, I mean, for some problems, you might actually want to or have to use like 40 or 100 terabytes, perhaps. And I think in the foreseeable future, there will be no shared memory machine which has that much memory. So one has to think about uh, parallelizing these codes using other parallelization paradigms because there are machines available which have aggregate memory of hundreds or perhaps even in the meantime perhaps petabytes of, of memory but uh, there will be both basically no shared memory machine. So we have to think about to, to, um, to develop um, ED codes which also can work on, on distributed memory machines and, and here it's just an example is the blue gene P machine which has rather small um, nodes or, or um, 
with, core, with a few cores and perhaps a, a gigabyte or two of memory per core or, or, or per node, depending on the, on the generation of the machine. But however, you have a large number of, um, of like uh, here, um, uh, rack and uh, node cards and then ra racks and then um, assembled machines. And they have like huge number of, of cores and also here 224 terabytes, a, a huge amount of memory, but it's all distributed a lot. And so you have to think about how to get these things done on such such machines. <clears throat> um, but one problem is, is that it's, um, since we, we're actually trying to distribute the problem in, in Hilbert space, I mean, Hilbert space, as far as we have understood, and I think many others struggle with it as well, there's no clear locality in Hilbert space. It, it's not like a, a, um, a partial differential equation of some physical um, uh, PDE, where somehow you, you have like a, make a spatial decomposition, and since your physics is local, you really know where your boundaries are. It's only um, between kind of nearest neighbor in space or in space time where you have to exchange information. Here in the Hilbert space, there's not, no, no locality as we know, which basically means that matrix elements uh, can potentially go from one subset of your Hilbert space to basically any other. It's still sparse, so it's, it does not have an infinite amount, it does not have a, a, um, a full connection structure in terms that all matrix elements are there. There are still a lot of sparse, but still kind of where they are in a coarse grained Hilbert space, it's still in, uh, potentially an all-to-all -all structure. So that makes it complicated and it's, it's more challenging for a machine to actually uh, cope with this large, uh, with, with this uh, coarse uh, um, connection structure. <clears throat> and, um, and another challenge now, if you come to really to, to exact ionization the way we described this, is also that um, we have seen that we, we use lookup tables in various variants in order to to, um, to do rapid calculation of matrix elements. But we have to worry now um, that these lookup tables are really uh, kind of small. And since we're now targeting spin systems, for example, in the close to 50, close to 50 spins, um, then, e then even tables which, which require only half of that spins uh, still have are tables which describe 24 spins, and then they can become large because 2 to the 24 is something like 16 millions, and if you have a lot of symmetries and so on, these tables can actually become quite sizable and use a few, few 10 or 100 megabytes, but if you're working on a blue gene machine where, say, the memory per core is of an order of a gigabyte, you actually start to get into, into limitations. So one has to think further how to do that, and then um, one can actually somehow come up with something like lean tables also for for the case with translation symmetries. And here is an illustration now for the, for the Kagome lattice, which, so that's a, a cut um, of, a, of a Kagome lattice. And what we're doing there basically is to decompose the Kagome lattice into three different sub lattices. So that's not a physical, that's not, not a physical choice. We're not constraining the physics, but it's just that we, we, we consider the Kagome lattice as being composed of three sub lattices. So here the gray one, the red one, and the, the violet one. So you see these are sub lattices and, 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 and what is nice about them is that under some symmetry operations, this, um, this um, a sub lattice of a given color is either mapped com completely onto another sub lattice with a different color or uh, within itself. But it never happens that if you apply a physical symmetry operation of the Kagome lattice, that, that two uh, sub lattices get mixed. Because if you somehow choose um, uh, a, a sublattice decomposition at random, if you apply a physical symmetry, there is some chance that, that some of the sites exchange between some colors, others stay the same, and so on. And you, you don't want that. You want that the symmetries act uh, kind of in a, in a, um, a convenient way on, on your sublattices. So there, there is not an infinite number of choices for sublattices, but here this, this uh, free sublattice thing is, is a convenient choice. And then we basically um, um, generate lookup tables which know about the configuration of these sub lattices and if you think through that you, you realize how to how to um, do um, lookup tables which use quite a little memory but still do not require too much computation so that it's, it's kind of the optimum to really reduce memory as much as we need but still be sufficiently fast lookup tables in order to have a, a, um, a rapid um, uh, matrix vector multiplication time. Um, and then basically what, what the, such a code is then doing is that um, each, each core, like each process in your MPI process, has a, has a certain number of, um, of representatives. 
Um, so it only sees a small part of your configurations and also has a small part of your large Lanchos vectors. But on, that, on these configurations, which are known, uh, he apl applies terms in the Hamiltonian, generates new states. And then with this lookup table, the code can figure out where on which other process that representative is stored. So that can be figured out locally. And then it basically puts a request for a matrix element into a, into a buffer. And then when the buffers are full on all the clusters, there's some collective MPI call where these requests for information or sending of information to other nodes is then done kind of um, simultaneously. And then there's a lot of traffic on the, on the network of the fast interconnect between the processors. And then the, they are exchanging these matrix elements uh, between the different um, um, MPI tasks which, which are connected by these matrix elements. Um, and so this can also be done. Um, and um, and then you, you might worry, since I said there is some kind of all-to-all -all structure, it might turn out that this is ex extremely inefficient, but actually using um, uh, cutting-edge um, hardware, like, for example, the, the blue gene uh, uh, P, at that time when we did the first runs of that size, it actually turns out to be uh, reasonably uh, fast. So, so first we made some tests with, uh, with the Kagome 42 site um, um, a lattice, which does not have that much, um, I mean, it is only slightly above 40 sites, but initially we used the code which does not deal with symmetries, but was just using um, um, SC conservation and the spin inversion, but no spatial symmetries. The, then the Hilbert space for that problem is something like 19 billions, and then um, if you use a thousand um, Intel Xeon InfiniBand uh, cores, which is a standard kind of um, um, Intel type cluster, which, which we have in many computing centers, then what one iteration takes 74 minutes of that time, but that's already like four years ago. That's not a, a current a simulation. And then we, we, we went to this 48 side Kagome lattice and, and used as much symmetries as we could for that code. And then the, the ground state sector um, has 250 billion um, states. I mean, it, it's known to like, we count them all, so that's the number of how many states there are in that sector. And then we did different runs, one on a um, one on a slightly slow um, um, machine with 1600 cores, but with a NUMA 5 link uh, for, the, for the interconnect. And so here one iteration uh, takes something like 20 minutes or a bit more. So that's not, not that fast. Uh, then we, we did a test on the same machine as that one, but with 3000 cores here. And then you get um, a time of 650 seconds, so like something like 11 minutes or so for one, one iteration. And then we also ported it to the blue gene P, which has a lot of processes, but they are not, I mean, an individual core of a blue gene P at the time is far less um, um, rapid than, than an Intel. So, so there is some, so you, it's not like 16,000 Intel cores, uh, but then on that machine, it, because it has a nice balance between computing speed of the processes compared to the bandwidth of the, of the interconnect, then you actually get a, an iteration time of slightly less than 10, than 10 minutes. And I don't have results now for the blue gene Q, but I think on the blue gene Q, it's it, the same um, thing runs uh, substantially uh, faster. <clears throat> so so that's, that shows you that the, this actually works. You can do um, a quite large solve for ground state of quite large eigenvalue problems the, um, that way. But something you might be worried about is um, what, what about convergence? We're, we're working in such huge Hilbert spaces, so, so is precision and round off errors everything under control, or should, be, should we be worried? So um, something we, we did there in order to test just for consistency, which is, I guess, you understand that this is important in computational physics to make sure that everything works out uh, fine. So something we did is a very simple test, is that, um, as we had discussed yesterday, the, the Lanchos algorithm basically um, converges uh, to the extremal values of the, of the spectrum. But it actually does that on both sides of the spectrum. So we're typically interested in the ground state, which means like the, the most negative um, or the, the smallest energy, the arithmetically smallest one. But the Lanchos algorithm also uh, converges to the under, other end of the spectrum. And since here we're interested in a, in a Heisenberg model on a, on a Kagome lattice, <coughs> uh, but the antiferromagnetic one, the antiferromagnetic side of the spectrum is really complicated, and that's what we want to understand. But at the other end of the spectrum, it's the negative Hamiltonian, which, is, uh, which has its ground state up there, and that's basically a, a ferromagnet. But the ferromagnet has no frustration, so you exactly know what the ground state energy of a Heisenberg ferromagnet on the Kagome is. And so in the same run, where you're actually interested in the antiferromagnetic physics, you can also just 
just check to what energy the, up, the other side of the spectrum goes, and this is the same run, so it's the same information, and then you can clearly see that the energy on the top end of the spectrum goes exactly to the ground state energy of the ferromagnet with the, with, the, with the other sign, but you can really check whether your complicated diagonalization on the other end of the spectrum is giving you the correct energy for a ferromagnet, which is exactly known. And, and ob obviously our results satisfy that constraint, so that's a nice consistency check. And another one uh, which, we, which we made is, um, um, so this is a, a one particular sector in our Hilbert space, which is, which is that large. Um, and then we did a run with double precision. That's what we typically do, where everything from the matrix element to the Lanzos vector and everything is, is, um, is done in double precision. And then, since um, actually increasing to, to higher precision is difficult, what we actually did was to scale down the precision. So what we call mixed precision here is that the Lanzos vectors were actually done in simple, uh, uh, with floating point numbers in single precision. So they have um, a ra um, kind of an epsilon, which is only um, a square root of what double precision. So it's more like 10 to the minus 7 or 8. <coughs> and uh, whereas the Hamiltonian matrix elements were still calculated with double precision. And, um, and then we, we redid the same run, we basically the same starting vector, but just with this mixed precision. And then we basically see that as long as, as there are, the mixed pre precision results are, are available, uh, the, the convergence of, um, because that's the instantaneous energy as a function of iteration, they really exactly do the same thing. So we, we really think that doing the double precision is really the physically correct thing and you're converging to the right thing. And, and if we're reducing the, the precision, um, it's not that the two, the two conversion processes start to fork and do different things. So it's really that one is just a more accurate version of the other, and there is no evidence for somehow accumulation of round-off errors or things going wrong with the, with the precision. So that's, that's actually good news. Okay, and, th and then we, um, we calculated some energies, but I think that's not so important right now. So we can also calculate the ground state energy and, and compare that to DMRG, and that is some valuable uh, con confirmation of DMRG results. And so um, with this, I, I would basically like to, to conclude the part of, of talking about, about the technical aspects and how to implement um, the exact organization um, um, codes. And, and here is a, a list of literature. Um, just a few which, which came to the, my mind where you can find something about exact ionization. So there are some lecture notes by Nicolas Lafrancy and, and uh, Didier Poilblanc. There are some lecture notes by Reinhard Noack and Salvatore Manmana, which also have a part on diagonalization methods. Then there is a lecture note by Alexander Weiss and Holger Feske on exact diagonalization techniques. And there's also a chapter which I wrote um, in a book on frustrated magnetism where where different numerical methods are, are described, but the part on exact diagonalization is kind of the most comprehensive one, and this is also complementary to, to others. And what I have not written down here, but, but Anders Sandvik, who was also lecturing here, uh, he, he might have shown you lecture notes which he wrote, which is mostly on Monte Carlo and, and SSC. There's actually also a part in that with, with exact diagonalization results, which is, which is actually also quite pedagogic for, for beginners. So it does not talk... Um, uh, so much, I guess, uh, about very advanced techniques, which, which I covered here, but if, uh, for a basic introduction, it's actually quite, quite valuable as well. <clears throat> so I, I see now that it's 12 o'clock. Should, should we make um, a break now? And I, I, I talk about the applications later. Yeah. Yeah, I think I will stop here, then we start on time, and I, I will briefly talk about applications, and there will be some, some smaller time to, to formulate the problem, and then you, you, might work, you can work on that in the tutor, tutorial part. Hmm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.